Ever feel like dolphins are swimming in some kind of aura of mystery? Like there's something about them. I don't know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We're diving into the history of humans and cetaceans. You know, dolphins, whales, porpoises. Right. The whole crew. And let me tell you, it is a wild ride. It really is. We had Lori Marino's research. She's like, you know, practically written the book on dolphin brains. Yeah, she's amazing. Plus, we've got this timeline of how cetaceans have gone from like gods to, well, you'll see. Yeah, it's fascinating um, how our perception of these creatures has shifted so dramatically. Dramatically is an understatement. Mm -hmm. Speaking of perceptions, get this, okay. Harming a dolphin in ancient Greece, big no-no. Really? Huge no-no. We're talking like punishable by death. Oh, wow. Like you'd messed with Poseidon himself. Mm -hmm. They were revered as like gods, messengers, almost like mythical beings. Absolutely. And that reverence, it wasn't um, it wasn't unique to Greece. The Minoans, Romans, even, um, you know, ancient cultures in Mesopotamia, they all kind of wove cetaceans into their um, myths and art giving them this almost like sacred status. It's like they weren't even seen as animals. Almost, yeah. It's like this otherworldly. So we've got thousands of years of humans basically worshiping dolphins, and then John C. Lilly enters the picture. Oh, boy, John Lilly. He starts out, he's doing some, like, you know, groundbreaking research on dolphin intelligence. Well, yeah. Even suggesting they have their own language, right? You're right. Lilly's early work was pioneering. He... um he really developed ways to, you know, interact with dolphins, study their communication, and he really put, um, you know, dolphin intelligence on the map. But that's where things... Um, yeah, take a turn. Take a turn, yeah. This is where the story gets, like, really interesting and a little strange. I mean, what was Lily thinking giving dolphins LSD? Well, you see, Lily became convinced that dolphins, they have the key to, like, interspecies communication, even um, contact with extraterrestrials. Oh, whoa, whoa. Yeah, he believed that LSD could um, unlock deeper levels of consciousness in dolphins, allowing them to communicate with us in ways that we hadn't imagined. So he's like trying to get dolphins high to talk to aliens. Essentially, yeah. That was his thinking. Wild. And that belief, combined with his research, kind of sparked a whole wave of, shall we say, new age interpretations of dolphins. You right, know, right, right. Like people were swimming with dolphins, <laughs> claiming these like... You know, transformative spiritual experiences. It's this whole idea of the um, dolphin mystique, which, you know, while seemingly harmless on the surface, yeah. it can actually lead to some problems because when we start, you know, projecting our ideas of mysticism or healing onto animals, it's easy to overlook the the potential harm that we might inflict, right? whether it's through, you know, unregulated therapy programs or just simply the stress of like excessive tourism and things like that. Yeah, I mean, you're totally right. It's almost like we went from one extreme to the other, from like worshiping dolphins as gods to, well, keeping them in tanks for our amusement. And that shift from reverence to exploitation, it really took off with the rise of um, marine parks. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I remember P.T. Barnum. The Circus King. The Circus King. He was one of the first to really capitalize on, you know, the public's fascination with these animals, putting beluga whales on display in like, you know. Like a sideshow, almost? Basically, yeah. It was all very sensationalized. <laughs> wow. And it wasn't long before um, places like Marineland and SeaWorld popped up. And suddenly these like majestic creatures were performing tricks for our entertainment. I mean, how did we go from fearing like divine retribution for harming a dolphin to making them do flips for a bucket of fish. Part of it was the, um, I guess, the prevailing scientific thought at the time. Cetaceans, they were seen as intelligent, yes, but not necessarily as sentient beings, you know, with complex emotions and social structures. That understanding, that came later. Right. It was oh. a different time. And as that understanding grew, so did the public concern. Right. right. By the 1970s, you've got the Save the Whales movement gaining momentum. Mm -hmm. People are starting to really question, like, the ethics of keeping these intelligent animals in artificial environments. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, the Save the Whales movement? Because I feel like that's one of those things that everyone's heard of. Sure. But they might not know the details. Yeah, it was a real turning point because before that, whales were primarily seen as just a resource to be exploited, right? They were hunted for their blubber and their meat. And Save the Whales really brought the brutality of those hunts into the public eye. And it wasn't just about the numbers, you know? It was about recognizing these animals as individuals as beings that were deserving of our compassion. Totally. And that shift in public opinion yeah. um, 
eventually led to some significant legal victories, right? Yeah. Like the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Absolutely. The MMPA passed in 1972, landmark piece of legislation in the United States. It outlawed the killing, the capture, or harassment of marine mammals in U.S. waters, and also by U.S. citizens on the high seas, which is huge. That's huge. It was a, you know, a huge win for conservationists. It was a sign that the tide was starting to turn. But the captivity industry, they're a resourceful bunch, right? Oh, yeah. They're not going down without a fight. They realized they couldn't just keep selling, like, you know, pure entertainment as public awareness grew. So they, they had to pivot. They had to adapt. Exactly. And this is where the concept of greenwashing comes into play. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Marine parks, they began rebranding themselves as, you know, centers of conservation and education. Okay. Emphasizing their research efforts and the importance of public awareness, right? Oh, so instead of just selling you a ticket to a show. Right. They're selling you on the idea that you're supporting conservation by being there. Yeah, exactly. Come see the orcas, but also you're helping save them. Did it work? To some extent, yes. Um... The larger tanks, the breeding programs, the educational exhibits, all of that, it did help to appease some concerns. But, you know, a growing number of people began questioning whether these efforts were truly making a difference for wild populations. Right, right. Or if it was simply just a, you know, clever way to maintain profits. No. While public opinion was shifting, right? Yeah. Kind of a PR move. Yeah, you could see that. It feels like a pivotal moment. This kind of clash between the old way of thinking about cetaceans. Yeah. And this like emerging understanding of their intelligence and their sentience, you know. Absolutely. And it all kind of came to a head with a tragic event that really shook the captivity industry to its core. We're talking about Don Brunshow, of course. Right. SeaWorld trainer. And her tragic death in 2010. It wasn't the first incident with an orca in captivity. Right. But it was the one that really, like, captured global attention. It really did. And and it sparked um, it sparked a conversation about the true cost yeah. of keeping these highly intelligent and social animals, you know, in these artificial environments. Right. Brancho's death, it was a stark reminder yeah. that these weren't just performers. Yeah. These were powerful predators with yeah. their own needs. Right. And complexities that captivity just, it couldn't fully accommodate. And that's where Blackfish kind of enters the picture. Blackfish, yeah. This documentary, it wasn't just a film. It, like, ignited a cultural firestorm. Absolutely. Blackfish, yeah. it didn't just, like, expose the underbelly of the captivity industry, you know. It empowered people to actually question what they'd been told, to demand better for these animals. And I think the film resonated with audiences because it wasn't just about, like, you know, facts and figures. Yeah. It was a powerful story, emotionally charged and and really impossible to ignore. It's fascinating, though, because our sources mentioned that the, like, the blackfish effect. Yeah. It wasn't just about the film itself. Right. You know? You're right. Researchers who who studied the film's impact, they found that it kind of landed at this this crucial moment when public awareness about animal welfare in general was already on the rise. Okay. You know, think about it. Like information was more accessible than ever with the internet and social media. People were starting to connect the dots, I think, between their everyday choices and the treatment of animals, yep. whether it was, you know, the food they ate or the entertainment they supported. So blackfish wasn't the only factor, but it was like throwing like gasoline on an already smoldering fire. Precisely. Yeah. It amplified those existing concerns. It created a platform for discussion. And ultimately, you know, it led to tangible changes. Speaking of tangible changes, what were some of the concrete outcomes that are linked to Blackfish? I mean, SeaWorld ending its orca breeding program. That was huge, right? Definitely. Yeah. That decision, while it was presented, you know, as part of this broader company evolution, right. it was a direct response to the public pressure ignited by Blackfish. You know, it was a clear signal that, that the public was no longer willing to support the spectacle of, of captive orcas performing tricks. Right. You know? And it wasn't just SeaWorld, was it? Our timeline mentions like legislation changes, okay. even other countries like making major moves. What were some of the like most significant legal victories? Well, one of the most notable was California's Orca Protection Act, which banned um, orca breeding, you know? Yeah. And those theatrical shows that had become so synonymous with SeaWorld. Yeah. It was a, a major win for animal welfare advocates, and it signaled this, this growing political will, I think, to address the issue of cetacean captivity. And internationally, you see similar trends starting to kind of pop up, right? Absolutely. Canada is phasing out cetacean captivity. Mm -hmm. And there have been, like, 
these incredible stories of captive whales being released back into the ocean in places like Russia. I mean, it's amazing to even think about. It really is, yeah. We've seen a remarkable shift in public consciousness and, and political action, really, in just a few short years. But here's a question that's kind of been on my mind. What happens to the animals that are already in captivity? Right. Those who spent years, even decades, in these, you know, artificial environments. Yeah. We can't just, like, magically return them to the wild, can we? It's a, it's a complex issue, and there are no easy answers. Many of these animals, particularly those who were born in captivity, yeah. wouldn't have the skills to survive in the open ocean. Right. They've never learned to hunt or to navigate right. or to interact with wild populations. So what's the alternative? What what happens to these animals as we move away from this model of keeping them in tanks for our entertainment? That's where this concept of seaside sanctuaries comes in, which are basically these large netted off areas of the ocean. Interesting. Where captive cetaceans can live out their days in a, in a more natural environment, you know. Right. They'll still receive care and oversight, but they'd have more space to roam, um, you know, more natural social interactions, right. and a chance to experience something closer to their natural habitat. It's a fascinating idea. Like It's like t retirement homes for cetaceans, you know. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the really encouraging thing is that it's not just an idea. Right. There are actual sanctuaries being yeah. established around the world. You're right. There's the sanctuary in Iceland for belugas is a great example. Oh, yeah. And there's another one in Nova Scotia for both orcas and belugas. Even like the National Aquarium in Baltimore. They're creating a sanctuary for their dolphins in Puerto Rico. It's a testament to this growing understanding, I think that we need to find a better way to coexist with these animals. From gods to tanks. Right. And now maybe to a more ethical middle ground. Yeah. But even with these positive changes, it feels important to acknowledge the, the ongoing threats. Oh, absolutely. That cetaceans are facing globally. You're absolutely right, yeah. While we celebrate these victories, it's crucial to remember that the story is far from over. It's incredible to think about the potential of AI, you know, to unlock those secrets. Mm -hmm. We've gone from, like, barely understanding these animals to potentially being able to decode their language. It really is remarkable. It's like it's like something out of science fiction, but it's happening right now. It really is. And it speaks to this, you know, larger theme of, like, our evolving relationship with cetaceans, right? As we develop new technologies, new ways of seeing the world, it challenges us to to reconsider our place within it. Yeah. To recognize that interconnectedness of all living things. I remember reading about Project CET. Mm -hmm. That's um, that's the Cetacean Translation Initiative, in the um, you know, research materials for this episode. Yeah, Project CET. Are, are there are there other like cutting edge projects focused on understanding and protecting cetaceans that our listeners should know about? Absolutely. Project CETI, it's definitely pushing boundaries, but it's not alone. Yeah. Um, there's there's fascinating research being done on whale culture. Okay. You know, using underwater acoustic monitoring to track whale migration patterns, to study their vocalizations, even identify individual whales based on their calls. And this information, it's critical for, you know, protecting breeding grounds, mitigating ship strikes, gaining a deeper understanding of their social structures. It's, it's really amazing work. It's like we're finally, like, tuning into this conversation. Right. That's been going on for millennia. Exactly. Right under the surface. And as we listen, as we learn, it it changes how we see these animals and ultimately it changes how we treat them, right? You've hit the nail on the head. It's this shift in perception okay. that will ultimately determine the fate of cetaceans. Totally. It's about moving beyond the, you know, this us versus them mentality. Right. And recognizing that, that we're all part of this intricate web of life. It's a powerful message. Yep. And it feels like particularly resonant right now, given the challenges our oceans face. I mean, we've talked about the dark chapters in our history with cetaceans. Yeah. The exploitation, the captivity, you know, the ongoing threats. But what gives you hope? What are some of the like, you know, glimmers of light in this in this complex story? You know, what gives me hope is seeing the next generation, people like you who are asking these tough questions, demanding better for our planet and all its inhabitants. Yeah. The growing awareness, the passion, the willingness to challenge the status quo. Yeah. That's where real change begins. Ooh. And it's not just about, you know, grand gestures. It's about the everyday choices that we make. Right. The information that we consume, the conversations that we have. All of that matters. So the next time someone sees a picture of a dolphin 
whether it's in a nature documentary, a news article about captivity, or even just a cartoon. Yep. What do you hope they'll remember? Remember that there is a, you know, complex individual behind those eyes, a creature capable of profound intelligence, emotion, social connection, yeah. a creature that deserves our respect, our compassion, and, you know, our commitment to protecting its home. Our shared ocean. Our shared ocean, exactly. It's been um it's been an incredible journey. It really has. Exploring this like intricate relationship between humans and cetaceans. We've covered a lot of ground. From ancient myths to cutting edge science, from the dark depths of exploitation to the, you know, glimmers of hope for a more harmonious future. Mm. We've seen how our perceptions of these animals have shaped their fate and ultimately how our actions will determine their future. And as we move forward, let's carry with us, you know, the sense of wonder, this respect for the natural world, and this understanding that the fate of cetaceans and, and indeed all life on Earth, it's inextricably linked to our own. That feels like the perfect note to end on. Mm. This deep dive has been an incredible learning experience, and I hope our listeners feel um, you know, inspired to continue exploring the fascinating world of cetaceans mm. and, and the role we all play in their future. 